So once George Pilate worked out the secretory pathway and how the different compartments are organized relative to each other, the proteins enter the ER, they go to the Golgi, and then they enter secretory vesicles for then exiting the cell, the question then became, well, how do proteins know to go to one compartment versus another compartment? What, where is the sorting information? And the key insights into that problem came from Gunter Blobel, another Nobel laureate, or if he weren't going to be a Nobel laureate with a name like that, it would have been an excellent Bond villain. But Gunter Blobel came up with this idea that proteins within their amino acid sequence contain particular sequence information that allows them to be directed to the correct compartment. And this was called the signal sequence hypothesis, that there was a set of amino acid sequences that acted as a signal for routing proteins to one particular apartment, compartment, such as the ER, versus another compartment, such as mitochondria or the nucleus or anywhere else you needed to sort or route different proteins. And this was a really powerful idea because that very simple, and it's a very simple paper proposing this idea, but once you propose the idea that there are amino acid sequences that act as addresses or zip codes for routing proteins to particular membrane-bound compartments, that means that there has to be an equivalent postal service for recognizing that information and ensuring that those proteins go to the correct compartment. So what that implied was in more detail is that there's a receptor to recognize the signal sequence. So there's a set of machinery that identifies and uh, binds to these uh, targeting sequences. And that there's a set of docking machinery that interacts with uh, the signal sequence in this, and the machinery that recognizes the signal sequences on a particular organelle. So as we'll talk about later, the, the canonical, the, the prototype for all of this was the ER signal sequence. That's why we always call it the signal sequence. But that signal sequence is recognized by the signal recognition particle. And the signal recognition particle in turn is interacts with the signal recognition particle receptor that's on the surface of the ER. So what you have are a set of machinery that recognize these targeting information and a corresponding set of machinery on the organelles that interact and interface with uh, the signal sequence recognition machinery. And so just this idea led to a whole slew of experiments and opened up the entire field of membrane trafficking for identifying both the targeting information, the machinery that recognizes the targeting information, and the docking machinery on every organelle that then provides the specificity. Now, what I'd like to do is just give you an overview about how all these different signal sequences or targeting sequences work, just to give you a flavor for the varieties of sorting mechanisms that are uh, possible within the cell. And this is just a subset of them, but they're kind of the archetypical examples that people often refer to or that you often find in textbooks or in cell biology classes. So, so the default state is having no sorting information. So if you don't have a signal sequence of any type, you, where is the protein made? It's made in the cytoplasm because that's where translation occurs. And so the final destination is the cytoplasm. And the transport mechanism, although there's no transport occurring in this case, is all post-translational. So the protein is made and then it just sits there and diffuses around the cytoplasm and is excluded from most of the organelles. Now, in contrast to that, if there are nuclear localization signals, these are signal sequences. These are peptide sequences that target proteins to the nucleus. You say, well, what, what has to go to the nucleus? All I do is keep DNA there. Well, pretty much anything that regulates DNA histones that package the DNA, the DNA replication machinery, the transcription machinery, the splicing machinery, all of those proteins or protein RNA complexes need to be assembled and transported into the nucleus. And of course, you have other mechanisms that we're, we'll be talking about later in the course about how things, 
get sorted out of the nucleus? How do you get RNA? How do you get other things out of the nucleus? But in the case of proteins that are being targeted like histones to, to be localized to the nucleus, the protein is made in the cytoplasm. Its ultimate destination is the nucleus. And then after translation is completed, there's a peptide sequence that's recognized by sorting machinery that allows it access into the nucleus. So that transport mechanism is post-translational. It's after translation. Now, it may seem that all of these things are the same, but now I'm gearing up to tell you where things start to, to vary. So if you think about mitochondria, how do proteins get into the mitochondria? So how do proteins that are involved in oxidative phosphorylation or a lot of the different metabolic processes that occur within mitochondria, how are those proteins that whose genes are encoded in the nucleus, how do those gene products get sorted into mitochondria? So that, again, they all have mitochondrial signal sequences. So they're translated in the cytoplasm and their ultimate destination is the mitochondria and the transport mechanism is post-translational. Now, what's interesting about mitochondrial sequences versus nuclear localization sequences, or at least the proteins, the mechanism of transport, is that the mechanism of transport differs. They're both post-translational, but in the case of the uh, transport into the nucleus, the, fully, the protein is translated, it folds, and then the folded protein is transported intact across the nuclear pore into the nucleus. In contrast, for mitochondria, what you'll have is you will translate the protein, it will fold, and then in order to get it across the mitochondrial membrane, you, it is physically unfolded, spooled across the membrane, and then refolded on the opposite side. So just even though both of these are post-translational sorting mechanisms, they use very different mechanistic bases. One case you fold it and then you unravel it and spool it across, that's the mitochondrial one. In the case of nucleus, what you do is you fold it and then just move it across intact. And that means that the reason for drawing attention to that is that while I won't go into mitochondrial sorting, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about nuclear localization. And the difference between these two mechanisms means that the pore, the channel, the translocation channel has to be very different. In order to move an intact protein across a membrane, you need a very large aperture structure to allow large proteins, like a 100 kiloton protein, to move across uh, uh, the membrane. So that's why nuclear, one of the reasons why nuclear pores are so large, and it has a lot of effects on how that actual transport mechanism works. In contrast, you spend a lot of energy, you fold a protein, a mitochondrial targeted protein, you fold it, and then you expend a fair amount of energy unfolding it and then refolding it in order to spool it across in a very, uh, through a very narrow aperture channel. So that's one of the differences. So you have three, so you have two different post-translational sorting mechanisms, but one sorts folded proteins and one sorts proteins ultimately via an unfolded intermediate. Now, there are other compartments and we're not gonna spend a lot of time on them. There's the peroxisome. Peroxisome has its own signal sequences. There are proteins that are translated in the cytoplasm, targeted to the peroxisome, and they're sorted there through a post-translational mechanism. That has become a little more complicated because there's now interactions between the peroxisome and the ER, so I'm not gonna elaborate on how not every protein uses a canonical peroxisome signal sequence anymore. So I'm, I'm gonna set that aside for right now. But then the, the prototype, kind of the, the, the prime example of the signal hypothesis is the ER signal sequence. And as I said, we often refer to this just as a signal sequence because it was the first one before all these different flavors of sorting sequences were identified. Now, what happens is this is the one where you begin to see some real contrasts in terms of where proteins are synthesized and the transport mechanisms. So, so the ER signal sequence is made in the cytoplasm because you initiate translation. The signal sequence is typically at the amino terminus. There are some uh, variants that are, have specialized sorting machinery, but 
the ER signal sequence is at the amino terminus, so it's the first part to spool out of the ribosome, and it is then recognized. And so the rest of the protein ends up spooling across uh, the ER after the initial recognition event has happened. And so the final destination of proteins that go into the ER, they can stay in the ER, they can be routed to the Golgi, the lysosome, or ultimately the plasma membrane. But what's interesting and what's novel about ER signal sequences or ER protein translocation is that the mechanism is co-translational. That you have this initial translation of the signal sequence that then gets recognized by the targeting machinery translation is arrested, and then you use translation to power uh, translocation. So you basically, the protein never gets a chance to fold because it's just spooled across into the ER, and then it folds completely within the ER. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of really good reasons for doing this, one of which is a lot of proteins, that, and the ER acts in some ways as a, an airlock for the cell. So it has a very specialized folding environment. So if you folded and then unfolded a protein, so if you folded it in the cytoplasm and then refolded it in the ER, you would potentially have a lot of different folding problems in the cytoplasm that would cause uh, proteotoxicity. So that's one of the reasons that the mechanism is set up this way. But it pr even though it's the first one discovered, it has a lot of unique novelty associated with it that makes it uh, quite distinct from the other mechanisms. Even though the ER has its own unique signal sequence uh, targeting features in terms of this co-translational mechanism, there are a set of questions that no matter what sorting mechanism you're examining always come up. And they're really good questions to focus on because if you understand those questions or the answers to those questions, you have a grasp of why that sorting mechanism is distinct from other sorting mechanisms. So, so the first question, whenever talking about any of these sorting mechanisms is, what is the nature of the signal sequence? Now, for most cases, it's an amino acid sequence. It's a peptide sequence within the primary amino acid sequence of the protein that's being sorted. And these sequences are different for different targets and for different cargos. So for the amino acid sequence, so for, for example, the ER signal sequence is usually at the amino terminus. So it has a particular position that you often encounter, at least for a normal secre fully secreted protein, like something like insulin or, or prolactin, a peptide hormone. And those are hydrophobic amino acids. It's a patch of hydrophobic amino acids. So, so there's some general rules often for some of these sorting sequences, but those rules can be quite plastic. Um, in general, it is a pure amino acid sequence, although later in the course we'll talk about one that's a sorting information to the lysosome where it's a post-translational modification to the protein. So the first question is, what is the nature of the signal sequence? Another uh, essential question is what recognizes the signal? In the case of ER signal sequences, it's SRP, the signal recognition particle. And then related to that is how is it recognized and how is the complex that's the, the signal sequence and the recognition complex, how is that duo docked to the right compartment? So what is the cognate receptor that's on the organelle of interest? So in the case of the ER, it's the SRP receptor. So you have SRP recognizing the signal sequence, and cleverly, there's an SRP receptor on the ER. And you see these pairs of recognition complexes and receptor complexes on the organelle that act to give specificity to the targeting machinery. And this is a recurring theme throughout all of protein sorting. The third question is, what's the nature of the translocation channel? Now, I alluded to some of this in that, depending on how proteins are getting across the membrane in question, whether they're folded, unfolded, co-translational, that has certain impacts on what the nature of the channel would have to be. Does it have to be a large channel? Can it be a, something more conventional membrane protein? 
you know, what, how is it actually structured? And, um, you know, as I mentioned, related to that is, do the proteins need to be unfolded to cross the membrane? And in the case of the ER, the ER channel is SEC61. It's often referred to as the protein translocation channel. And there, proteins are spooled across co-translational, so they never even get a chance to fold and then be unfolded. It's just spooled through like slurping up spaghetti. But that is in contrast to the nuclear pore, where proteins move across intact, completely folded, which requires a much larger aperture, ch aperture channel and a completely different mechanism for driving uh, proteins into the nucleus. And lastly, and this I think is often one of the more interesting questions and, and it's a little less intuitive, is what's the energy short source for transport? Because in a lot of these cases, what you're doing is you're taking a protein and you're concentrating it often against a pro uh, concentration gradient. Or you're packing a lot of, for example, you're packing a lot of histones into the nucleus and there's virtually no histones in the cytoplasm. So as a result, how, where's the energy to, to generate that type of concentration? How, how do you get, you have to use energy in order to sort proteins, to make things go from dispersed to organized. So what's the source of energy? And the source of energy for many of these systems is very different. So in the case of ER protein translocation, you capture the energy from translation to spool the protein right through the membrane, whereas in the nucleus, you use a completely different energy source for concentrating uh, nuclear localized proteins into the nucleus. And so those are the essential questions that if no matter, I'm gonna focus mainly on ER protein sorting, but these are the sets of questions. If you can answer these four questions for whatever protein targeting system you're looking at in your class, you'll be really good to go because then you'll know the basics of the machinery and kind of how it works. And then it's just enumerating the details.